Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight... I will play whatever role he wants me to play. Senator Tammy Duckworth goes one-on-one -on -one with Carol Marine about the possibility of being Joe Biden's running mate. Right now, we are on the precipice. A warning, a spike in coronavirus cases could lead to a reopening reversal. Can we maintain safety and health guidance? How local bar owners are trying to operate in a pandemic while respecting official constraints. People cheat. Mail ballots are a very dangerous thing for this country because they're cheaters. Does voting by mail really lead to more voter fraud as the president asserts? Our Spotlight's politics team looks at whether Alderman Kerry Austin's positive COVID-19 test will affect the ongoing federal probe of her and her office. Meet the local pastor whose music from the 70s has reached audiences worldwide. And it is out with the meat and in with the tofu, the story of a meatpacking plant turned vegan farmer's market on the city's southwest side. But first, we get to some of today's top stories, and for that, we go right back to you, Brandis. Paris, former President Barack Obama and rapper Kanye West are among the prominent people whose Twitter accounts were hacked today and tweets were posted that appeared to promote a cryptocurrency scam. The tweets, promising to double all payments to a Bitcoin address for the next 30 minutes, seem to have been taken down. Other verified profiles were also hit, including Joe Biden, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, and others. In a tweet this afternoon, Twitter said that the company is aware of the security incident and is taking steps to fix it. Meanwhile, the ability to tweet and reset passwords would be limited. And we'll have more on this later on in Spotlight Politics. The Cook County Jail is touting the results of a report showing the jail did successfully take steps to mitigate the spread of coronavirus in the, sit in the facility. A jail of just under 5,000 people now, we have 11 people who are positive, okay, 11. And of those 11, eight or nine of them came in positive from the outside. So the impactfulness of what was done here cannot be underestimated. A combination of authors from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as Cook County Health and other local health agencies, wrote the report which describes the timing of first detecting COVID-19 in the jail and steps the jail took, including shifting to single cell occupancy, increasing testing, and requiring masks for both staff and detainees. The report says cases at the jail began to decline while they increased in Chicago. There's a changing of the guard in the second and third highest ranking members of the Chicago Police Department. Yesterday on this broadcast, we first heard from first Deputy Superintendent Anthony Riccio on his retirement. At a promotion ceremony today, Superintendent David Brown announced that Riccio will be replaced by Eric Carter, a 28 year member of the department. Also retiring in August is Chief of Patrol Fred Waller, the department's third in command. Waller is being replaced by 25 year veteran Brian McDermott, seen here. These two men will be greatly missed. But CPD, as you see, has a deep bench. A new team of leaders is ready to take our department into a new era of policing. I have instructed this next generation of leaders to be the mechanisms for change that residents throughout this city are demanding. Also today, a committee of aldermen approved a new contract for police sergeants, lieutenants and captains that would allow the investigation of anonymous complaints against the brass. Find out what the concerns are about that agreement by heading to our website. And now to Carol Marine and an Illinois politician making waves on the national scene. Carol. Brandis, this just in, the Illinois Democratic Party, by a voice vote, has endorsed U.S. Senator Tammy Duckworth for vice president. No, Joe Biden has not made his pick public, but Duckworth is widely reported to be high on his short list. Biden has promised to select a woman for the role, and supporters say Duckworth's credentials as a veteran and war hero, and more recently as a member of the U.S. House and Senate, make her a strong choice. But the newfound attention has also meant a ferocious attack from the right. We are joined now by Senator Tammy Duckworth. Thanks so much for being here. It's good to be on, Carol. How are you today? I'm well. So, Senator, let's get the elephant out of the room first. Have you been in high-level talks with the Biden campaign 
about being his running mate? Well, I've had conversations with the Biden campaign, and what I told them is whatever he decides he wants me to do to help him be elected president of the United States, I will do. Whether uh, that is to go out and sweep floors in a VA hospital, I will do that um, because we truly need his leadership in the White House to help us recover from the multiple crises that this Trump administration has put us into. So I'm assuming you've been vetted by the FBI already. Well, you know, uh, for the last 23 years, I, I served in the military, so uh, I've had a secret clearance for quite a while now. <laughs> okay. There will be people, and I know you know this, deeply disappointed if Mr. Biden doesn't choose a black woman. Does this moment in our history cry out for that kind of choice? Well, you know, I think it's historic that he's going to choose a woman, first off, and I'm so thrilled to be mentioned in the same name as so many of these other wonderful women, uh, especially women of color. Um, but I will tell you that, again, Joe Biden is going to choose whoever he thinks is the best person to help him serve this country. And I will play whatever role he wants me to play. Uh, I am, you know, I have a pretty good day job, Carol. I love being this uh, junior senator from Illinois, serving the people of Illinois. So whatever it is that I can do to get Joe Biden elected, I will do. You have been severely attacked on the right by Fox's Tucker Carlson. Here is just a, a tiny bit of what he has said. Tammy Duckworth is a callous hack who ignored the suffering of actual veterans when it actually mattered. She has no moral authority. She is just a politician like the rest of them. Your response has been to tell Mr. Carlson to walk a mile in your titanium legs if he wants to figure that out. But his ferocious anger aside, when it comes to your voting record in the Senate, it has been along party lines, right? Well, I think I have a more moderate voting record. I do have a progressive uh, record as well, but I've also been one to um, look at the needs of my state first and foremost. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think uh, that my voting record is uh, right up there uh, to be matched with anyone else. I'm very proud of it. I've always put the needs of my country and my state above everything else. Will there be a Senate investigation of reports of, of so-called Russian bounties on our troops in Afghanistan? So I have personally called for both a hearing in the Senate Armed Services Committee as well as an investigation by the Department of the Army into whether any of the woundings and deaths of American servicemen and women in Afghanistan were the result of Russian bounty, uh, the, their bounty program. Can you believe it, Carol, that when we asked the question of the Department of the Army if they've even done an investigation into whether or not any of the deaths were linked to this bounty program, they said no. What a failure in leadership of this president that he didn't even bother to look into whether or not uh, the troops that we have um, that have been wounded have already been uh, done, had the woundings as a result of these bounties. The $600 a week CARES Act, Act is going to expire at the end of the month. And Republicans, though their position appears to be changing a little bit, argue they really fear more po payments are going to disincentivize people returning to work, especially those people who don't make that much on, on their own jobs. Are you for extending that act and for how long? And give us your thoughts. Yeah. I, am, I am for extending that act. And let me tell you why, Carol. It's because we do not currently have a child care system in this country that will support working families. So our schools right now are not going back into session, uh, and it's all piecemeal across the country. So imagine that you are a single working parent, and you have to go back to work, but school is not in session. What happens? Uh, how, how do we... Uh, have these essential workers go back to work and not provide for child care. Our working families are facing tremendous stresses right now. And let me tell you that those $600 uh, additional are not being wasted. They're being spent on things like food and rent and mortgage and child care, something that we desperately need to support our working families on. Senator Duckworth, thank you for being here. We're going to come right back with a few, in a few minutes to talk about the federal response to COVID-19 and other issues. So stay right there. We'll be back. Brandis, we go back to you. Carol, thank you. Stay-at-home orders that had kept Illinoisans at home since mid-March eased about two and a half weeks ago when the state entered the fourth phase of Governor J.B. Pritzker's reopening plan. But could a rise in cases of COVID-19 trigger a reversal? Amanda Vinicky joins us now with the latest. Amanda. 
Brandis, Illinois has made significant headway in keeping down coronavirus cases. In mid-May, the positivity rate, that is a measure of positive cases among those who are tested, reached a peak of 23%. Now it is 3%. You can see in this chart, the number of daily cases spiking and then going down, but there is starting to be an uptick. And the U.S. is seeing surges in other states, among them neighbors like Wisconsin, Iowa. Many people want to know if we're out of the woods and they're wondering what's next. So I'm here today to outline the path ahead and make sure that we all know what will cause us to impose further mitigation. The governor has outlined specific metrics that would trigger such rollbacks, a sustained increase in the average positivity rate and increased COVID-19 related hospital admissions or three consecutive days in which the positivity rate is 8% or more. In the event that happens, there's a menu of options the state would consider taking actions that is or mitigations as the governor would describe it now for bars and restaurants that would range from reducing the number of diners allowed indoors and suspending indoor dining to returning to takeout only for hospitals that could once again mean suspension of so-called elective surgeries for offices perhaps returning to remote learning and for stores it would start with reducing capacity or the number of shoppers who are allowed inside at one time to completely once again closing all non-essential retail. The governor encouraged people to continue to take precautions, wash your hands frequently, wear a mask so that it does not get to that point. A quixotic rush to regain a shadow of our former lives today will just delay a real return to normal later on. When you go out without a mask on, host secret parties, stuff your bar or restaurant to capacity despite the warnings, ignore common sense in your worship practices. It's not a political statement. You're hurting your neighbor who is desperate to keep their business open, or your friend who has an immunocompromised child who has been inside for months. The governor pointedly sending a message as he faces lawsuits among them from parents in Clay County suing against the masks in schools requirement and a Republican legislator who has had success in court saying that Pritzker has overstepped his executive authority with these COVID orders. Now, regardless, it's not just the metrics that are new, so too are the regions in which COVID-19 will be tracked. Previously, the state was divided into four regions. You can see that in the map that is on the left. It's a source of consternation for places, say, that didn't want to be grouped in with the city of Chicago. Going forward, Illinois is going to be using the map that is on the right, in which the state is divided into 11 regions, suburban Cook County, its own region, as is Chicago. Speaking of. Right now, we are on the precipice. We are dangerously close to going back to a dangerous state of conditions. Mayor Lori Lightfoot says a rise in cases among young people is of particular concern. She accused residents of ignoring public health warnings and says if that continues, she won't hesitate to reinstitute restrictions. Some of you have joked that I'm like the mom uh, who will tear in the car around when you're acting up. No, friends, it's actually worse. I won't just turn the car around. I'm going to shut it off. I'm going to kick you out and I'm going to make you walk home. Chicago's public health director says her top metric is keeping the city's average number of confirmed COVID-19 cases under 200. Today, Chicago's at 192 and Dr. Ellison Arwadi says she does expect it is going to go up. And for me, that means we are back in a caution state. It does not equal an automatic rollback. What we do when we are over 200 new cases is look at our local epidemiology, our local data, and say what is driving that increase. For example, if the city sees a lot of cases stemming from people in bars, then Chicago might impose new restrictions on bars. More on that just ahead. Also, what to do if you come in contact with somebody who does test positive for COVID-19? We got instructions today from the state's public health director, Dr. Ngozi Nzike. So after the show, check out our website for her guidance. Brandis, back to you. 
That's right. And Amanda, we'll see you in a little bit in Spotlight Politics along with the rest of the team. Thank you. And now to Paris shots and one business sector that's getting some pushback from officials about their reopening Paris. Brandon, bars have been open since the middle of June, and since that time, new coronavirus cases in young people are spiking. The city has issued dozens of warnings, 17 citations, and closed one bar down completely. So how are bar owners and managers handling their business and the safety of customers and employees in the face of these developments? Joining us are Norman Bolden, owner of Norman's Bistro on the south side. Jim Weber, manager of At North Bar in the Wicker Park neighborhood and Ryan C, managing partner at the J Parker in Lincoln Park. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks for having us. All right, so let's quickly reveal the guidelines right now. Face masks for employees and patrons operating at a 25% capacity with no more than 50 people in any room. All tables have to be six feet apart, no more than 10 people per table. Last call for alcohol purchases is 11 and closing time one hour after that at midnight. Jim, are these reasonable guidelines uh, to be able to be safe and do business? Well, definitely to be safe now to, for business, it's it's tough to make money in that those limitations, you know, for what we do because we don't serve food. You know, we're just a bar where you do live live performance like stand up comedy and a lot of private parties. So that's are you able to still do stand up comedy? We've done a few shows, you know, at twenty five people um, spread out. Everyone was great, wore masks, um, and it felt good to laugh again and to laugh with people around is very healing uh but uh it's gonna be tough to keep to do that and make money doing that no be, doubt you know. no doubt that's a healing um tonic right yeah. now uh, norman you at your place you have an outdoor patio you're actually taking people's temperatures before they come in are you confident that you can conduct your business safely and and still make enough money uh, yes, we've been very, very fortunate in, in that we, we have a fairly large patio. Um, our dining room is, is a large space and the windows open, so it, which allows us to utilize the uh, dining room space. Um, and in the, in the bar area, we can typically ac accommodate roughly about 20 people um, based on the current situation. But with checking temperatures and assuring that people are wearing masks and providing hand sanitizer, um, I think those factors have assisted us in doing business in a compliant way and uh, so assuring that we're, we're meeting the, the um, occupancy expectations. All right, let's hear really quickly what Mayor Lightfoot had to say today about young people. She pushed them pretty hard, saying that they are seeing a disproportionate share of cases right now. In the 18 to 29 year old cohort where we're starting to see an uptick in cases. 18 to 29, uh, Ryan at the Jay Parker, you have a really young clientele. What are you seeing? Are they right. adhering to mask wearing, social distancing? You know, I want to say to, to Jim's point, laughter is important, obviously. Um, but yes, our demographic is, is much younger, but the vast majority of people are compliant and they understand that Illinois numbers are very impressive and we need to stay in the course, but you do have your outliers where you have to make sure they're wearing their masks. And when we ask them to do so, they seem to be doing that. And Governor Pritzker summed up the best practices uh, recently with an alliterative device uh, for folks. Let's hear what he had to say. We wanna make sure that everybody who's in the age category 20 to 29, not to mention everybody else knows the three W's, right? Wear a mask, you know, wash your hands, watch your distance. So, Jim, are you worried that if young people don't get this message that your establishment and others might have to shut down again? Yeah, very worried about that. And, uh, that's why we joined, like, NEVA, the National Independent Venue Association, who's lobbying Congress. They have a couple bills in the House to get relief because we, to not operate at even half capacity is going to be hard, let alone a quarter capacity. And if we get shut down again, I, it's going to be hard to reopen. And Norman, you know, we were talking about uh, laughter being good tonic um, at your bar, as I understand, you know, the recent uh, civil unrest has been a topic of conversation, people coming together to talk about that. What has that been like in your establishment? Oh, well, it's, you know, I've um, seen that uh, there, there's just been more, more conversation uh, around um, the past protests and protests from the, from the 60s. Um, so sort of connecting 
the two generations in conversation, um, not so much around um, COVID in that because we're so insisting that people apply, I mean, comply coming in, that it doesn't become much of a conversation while in the, in, in the space. So tonic, uh, the, the laughter is a tonic, conversation is a tonic. Uh, Ryan, you know, it seems like um, the governor, the mayor are talking about bars. Are bars being scapegoated here uh, or, or is it uh, appropriate to put all this focus on bars? You know, I don't, I don't think so. I think um, people that, that are coming to bars may have a little bit more relaxed approach to safety, but at the end of the day, it's all about staff and patron safety. And if you're not doing it, you're not following the CDC guidelines. And, and listen, they say that if you wear masks, you sanitize, you wash your hands, you don't touch your face, it really mitigates your risk. So regardless of what age, even though our age group here is a little bit younger, um, the facts are the facts, the numbers are the numbers, and, and if we keep staying the course, I think we'll be just fine. And uh, Jim, you know, the city has been strict on enforcement to mitigate some of this. They investigated 483, more than 1,000 complaints. They've issued 81 warnings, 17 citations, closed one bar down completely. Do you think all of this enforcement is necessary or overkill? Uh, I, think it's, it's, I think it's necessary because my biggest fear is if a lot of people aren't following the guidelines, then they'll shut everyone down. So at least they can single out the ones that are just really not following any kind of guideline and just packing them in and just not caring and trying to get that quick buck. But, and I think that, uh, but I think if they're checking places and everyone, most people are complying, we're better chance of staying open. My thanks to Norman Bolden, Jim Weber, and Ryan C. Thanks very much, Paris. Thank you for having us. Great to have you. And up next, President Trump says he expects massive election fraud this November. What do local election officials think about that? But first, a look at the weather. A record 121,000 Chicagoans have sent in applications to vote by mail. This comes as states across the country are expanding their vote by mail offerings due to COVID-19 concerns. It's prompted a rash of statements from President Trump that he believes the 2020 election will be rigged, although the president does not offer any basis for his assertions of widespread voter fraud when people already do vote by mail. So are Chicago, Illinois, and the country prepared for November? Joining us are Matt Dietrich, spokesman for the Illinois State Board of Elections, and Jim Allen, spokesman for the Chicago Board of Elections. Gentlemen, it's good to see you and talk to you again. Thanks for being here. Good evening, Paris. Thank you, Paris. All right, so Jim Allen, 121,000 vote by mail applications, a record, as we mentioned. Is Chicago ready to handle that load on November 3rd? We're preparing for it. In fact, we're preparing for uh, three, four, five times that many. Uh, so we're going to have drop boxes at every early voting site with that are staffed with uh, time stamp machines that will time and date and location stamp uh, the receipt of every item in case people don't want to use the mail to return their, their ballot. So we think that'll be really convenient. People will be in and out. We also are gathering signatures. We're, we're in the process of preparing a mailing to 900,000 voters who qualify for vote by mail ballots. Those are people who voted in the last two years and we'll be capturing their signatures in case they've been updated uh, because we have a number of voters who've been registered at the same location for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So their signatures may have changed. We want to eliminate any kind of uh, bumps in the road for those voters. And next, we're uh, going to be gearing up so that we, if we run into any issues with anybody's uh, return ballot return envelope, such as the signature not matching, we're going to be doing our best to use phone and email to contact people immediately so we can resolve those issues. And Matt Dietrich, you know, this is part of the governor's um, push to send applications for mail-in balloting to every uh, eligible Illinois voter, meaning they voted uh, in the last uh, in the election since 2018. How do you ensure on a statewide level that um, this will work? It'll go to the current addresses of voters and they all will be eligible voters. Well, I think the uh, the other 107 local election authorities in Illinois outside of Chicago uh, will be doing much like what Jim just described. 
Uh, they are the ones who actually have the contact with their voters. They have the records to show who has voted in any of the last three statewide elections. They have the signatures uh, for the voting records and they will be checking the signatures that are received on um, mail ballots against those signatures. We mentioned President Trump has been critical. Without attribution, he said the upcoming election, he believes, will be rigged because of mail. And let's hear what he says about it. They cheat, okay? People cheat. Mail ballots are a very dangerous thing for this country because they're cheaters. They go and collect them. They're fraudulent in many cases. You got to vote. And he's uh, put up some tweets uh, to that effect as well, even though he's defended his own absentee balloting, even though they're the same thing, absentee vote by mail. Uh, Jim Allen, are you aware of any evidence of widespread voter fraud if there's more vote by mail? No, it's, it's extremely rare. You see extremely rare instances in states that, in, that operate entirely vote by mail. Uh, it is detectable. It is correctable when in the rare cases it does happen. There, there have been a few recent cases, uh, one in Texas, uh, another one recently in New Jersey, and then charges recently filed in Kansas. And in each of these uh, instances, uh, you know, you have the, the typical red flags of the signatures not matching the, uh, the, the uh, registration record, or you have an attempt to uh, mail ballots to one house uh, or one address uh, from a variety of different voters and or voters coming in and, not and notifying the election authority that, uh, you know, in these rare instances, again, that uh, they didn't apply to vote by mail. So it's, it's very easily uh, detected. It's very easily investigated and corrected. And I uh, want to take a look at a map of vote by mail across the United States. So different states do it differently. The orange, that's where you don't need an excuse to vote by mail. Green, you do need an excuse. And the purple states are all vote by mail. So Matt Dietrich, which, with this expansion in several states, do you believe the national systems are ready for the volume coming on November 3rd? Well, that's going to be a, a, a challenge for a lot of election jurisdictions. And it's really just going to depend on how uh, readily voters accept, you know, how, how many of them actually return those applications that they're going to be receiving. Um, and, and do they return those all, you know, are they mailing those the day before election day or are they coming in incrementally so that at the county clerk's office or at the board of elections, they get a steady workflow that they can process as they come in. A uh, lot of questions and we really can't project uh, statewide at this point any, any with any accuracy what we should expect we know that in the 2018 general election 9.3 percent of those ballots were uh, mail ballots in the primary back in march 9.1 percent so and and we've seen incremental growth in vote by mail in illinois so we knew it was going to expand we're really trying to push it now because people are very fearful about uh infection with, uh, with covid and coronavirus spreading in in-person voting so it we just don't know. Uh, we have no indication now um, how great the response is going to be. How widespread it's going to be. Speaking of that fear, mm -hmm. Jim Allen, uh, back in the primary, you were pretty harried uh, that the governor allowed um, in-person voting to go on uh, amid COVID. Are you confident this time that it'll be safe in person amid COVID? No, it, it's it, we're an entirely different situation now where we're we're more than 100 days before the deadline and we've already set a record for vote by mail. Uh, as Matt meant for reference just now, you know, the, the mailings that are going to occur, we look we should be having most of our vote by mail applications by the middle of September so that we can mail out ballots at the end of September and early October. There's going to be a lot more time. Uh, the important thing that the General Assembly and the governor signed off on was that November 3rd is going to be a state holiday. And one of the biggest challenges that election jurisdictions here, Milwaukee, Atlanta, and other places had was that private facilities canceled at the last minute and that eliminated polling places. And by declaring this a state holiday, that's gonna make more public buildings and more large rooms in those public buildings, such as school campuses and gyms available on election day. So we feel confident moving forward that we're gonna have more people who are gonna be voting in early voting and vote by mail and fewer people showing up on election day, but we're also gonna be prepared to open all of our polling places. All right, we're gonna to have to leave it there. My thanks to Jim Allen and Matt Dietrich for joining us.
Thank you. Thank you, Paris. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, a local choir's 40-plus-year-old music is sampled by Kanye West and more. Look at Chicago. What a disaster. And we're waiting. President Trump takes aim at Chicago's pervasive violence again. Our spotlight team looks closer at that and more topics. And how a former meatpacking plant became host to a vegan farmer's market. But first we go back to Carol Marine with one of Joe Biden's possible VP picks. Carol. We're back now with more from U.S. Senators Tammy Duckworth. Senator, this is what the president is saying about the coronavirus and the reopening of schools in the coming month. We have to open our schools. Open our schools. Stop this nonsense. Senator, you have a five-year-old school-age daughter. If schools open next month, will you be sending her? Well, I would need to know whether or not the schools are being given the sufficient equipment to keep my daughter safe. I very much want her to go back to school. One of the things I've learned homeschooling her is that I am not trained. I am not a trained educator. I can fly helicopters and I can serve in the Senate, but I am not very good at teaching a five-year-old how to the alphabet, to do the alphabet and, and to learn to read and write. We need educators for that. God bless them for the work that they do. But we have to keep our educators and our children safe. So this administration has not provided any guidelines to schools. Uh, they've failed in keeping our citizens safe. And I want to make sure first and foremost, like many families and moms and dads, if whether or not I'm sending my daughter into a, a system where she's going to be exposed to COVID-19 or whether she'll be safe. That's my primary decision in whether or not my daughter will go back to school. And speaking of COVID-19, right behind you on your bookshelf, do I see the face of Anthony Fauci peeking up. Do you mind showing us that? Oh, yes, right here. <laughs> My cousin just gave me that. She's a pediatrician. And so, yes, I wanted to show some support for Dr. Fauci and uh, his calls for more testing and his calls for more PPE and making sure that we keep Americans safe. Senator Tammy Duckworth, thank you very much for spending some time with us today. Brandis, we go back to you. Thanks, Carol. A Southside Pentecostal preacher made music in the 1970s that's reached international audiences in recent years by way of some high profile artists. Chicago Tonight's Evan Garcia visited Pastor T.L. Barrett and his band on Sunday to learn more. Pastor T.L. Barrett is playing through his first sound check since COVID-19 shut down his Pentecostal church on Chicago's South Side more than four months ago. Music is an instrumental part of Pastor Barrett's preaching and recent popularity. In 2016, Chicago native Kanye West sampled music recorded by Pastor T.L. Barrett and his youth choir 40 years earlier in 1976. It was good music, but it didn't come prominent until fast forward 40 years later. You know, you, you're doing an interview about music that I wrote generations ago. And some of the people that are playing with me now we're playing on that album, on those albums. Keyboardist Gary Riley played on the original track Kanye West sampled, as well as the 1971 recording of Nobody Knows, which Under Armour used in a Steph Curry sneaker ad in 2016. That's interesting. Now make that old. <laughs> that time we was drawing young people because they you know young people like beats you know they like different styles of you know R&B so I guess that's how it, it came about you know. Twin brothers Wayne and Dwayne Barrett no relation to the pastor were two of those young people who joined the youth choir from the nearby Robert Taylor housing projects. You go back to the history of African American music black music is that um, you listen to some of the hymns and different things like that, how he incorporated some of those lyrics into those songs that we did at that time. Sunday was Pastor Barrett's first indoor service since the COVID-19 outbreak. 
he attests to the power of music. There are some people, the spoken word just doesn't do it for them. But if you put some music to those words, you got them. For Chicago Tonight, this is Evan Garcia. And you can visit our website to listen to more music from Pastor T.L. Barrett. Elected officials flirt with a possible pandemic pullback. Meanwhile, the reopening debate rages over schools, and President Trump weighs in again on Chicago's pervasive violence. Here with all that and more is our Spotlight Politics team of Amanda Vinicky, Paris Schutz, Heather Sharon, and Carol Martin. Hello, Carol Marine, I'm so sorry. Hello, everybody. Hey. Um, <laughs> let's start with the, the possible pandemic pullback uh, in Illinois. As you heard earlier in the show, Mayor Lightfoot says she'll do everything in her power to reverse the uptick in COVID-19 cases. Let's hear what she had to say to the young people in the city. I won't just turn the car around. I'm gonna shut it off, I'm gonna kick you out, and I'm gonna make you walk home. That's who I am. That's who I must be for you and everyone else in the city to make sure that we continue to be safe. And right now, we are on the precipice. We are dangerously close to going back to a dangerous state of conditions gonna make you walk home. Heather, uh, will the mom humor, you know, will that affect, will it stick with young people? Well, it's worked so far. I think it's an open question whether it's going to get people to stop sort of packing into bars and not wearing masks because the really the, the increase is coming from people age 18 to 29. And it's, you know, perhaps Dr. Ellison already said last week a little bit of COVID fatigue. They're tired of wearing the mask. They miss their friends. But the fear is, is that while they might not get sick or even really sick, they might infect other people who will get very sick and might in fact die. So um, it's a real sort of like, uh, we're right at that trigger point where things would start to get closed. And I think bars and perhaps indoor dining would be the first thing that the, the mayor would look to sort of roll back. And Chicago's positivity rate, it, you know, it's fluctuated near the top of the ceiling of uh, for phase four pullback. Even Alderman Kerry Austin is COVID positive. You know, Paris, can Chicago afford a reversal? Well, and Alderman Kerry Austin, by the way, who has had some health problems in the past few years, she sent out a letter last week uh, telling her constituents she had tested positive for COVID-19, but she was on the path to recovery. Obviously, um, um, you know, best wishes to Alderman Austin uh, and hopes that she does get better. Uh, and in terms of affording another shutdown, I think I, I think the mayor and the governor don't want to do it. I mean, I think it took a lot of political capital to do it the first time. People kind of bought in. And if you talk to retailers, they say they desperately don't want to go back. I mean, they're having enough time with the partial, enough of a hard time with the partial reopening. And what I've talked to uh, retailers about is if there is a shutdown, like in the fall, October, November, December, it's game over because that's when they make all their money. That's the holiday season. That's when they make back all their margins. That's when they absolutely can't close. Well, and to me, what, the stick that the mayor has, that in a sense the governor doesn't really statewide, is the taking away of these business licenses. Again, the governor does have that ability to some degree, but uh, if you're a business and you want to stay in business, as the mayor has made good on some of the threats, she'll shut you down if you pack a bar over those capacity limits. So. To me, that is sort of the key message as well to business owners. If you want to stay, you've asked for, for us to allow people to dine indoors, to drink indoors, to help you to survive. There has to be sort of an exchange there. So I, I think that is perhaps going to be one of the big keys going forward. And, you know, listen, I live in Lincoln Park, which is becoming a severe hotspot. My sister lives in Lake Zurich, where sports camps open and shut down within two days because it may be that parents let their kids party and then go to sports camps before they ended up testing positive. These are, you know, forest fires among us. And if we, not just business owners, but we as citizens don't get a grip on this and take it seriously, we're taking down all of those around us. 
And Carol, you know, speaking of Alderman Austin, what's the word on her federal uh, investigation or federal probe? The word is, Brandis, that I hear is that it is still barreling on. The difficulty because of COVID is that grand juries cannot easily or as often meet in the federal building, though they have met. And, and I hearken back to, and it's in the day, but Alderman Bill Henry of the West Side in 1987 ended up being in the crosshairs of the feds. He ended up getting cancer, but he was indicted before he slipped their grip because he died. The feds are going to be only marginally sympathetic to your illness if they are proceeding what they believe is your criminality. Now, the governor also weighed in about turning the car around. Let's listen to what he had to say. It's important when we see trends in our data that indicate a potential problem in any region of Illinois that we need to start tightening mitigations in that region before it's too late. Carol, back to you. Is this the kind of thing, does this make sense, this sort of changing? You know, it, some of it really does because the state of Illinois is not homogenous. Downstate has different geographic issues, central Illinois does, and so if you kind of quadrant it off, there may be some rationale for that. But we all know that we travel beyond these boundaries. So I think he's trying to do a kind of compromise in recognition that all places are not equal. But to Larry Lightfoot's point, you may have to shut down that theory too if it isn't working after a while. Illinois has done really pretty well and Chicago has done pretty well, but we are on the upward trajectory. Yeah, you know, Brandis, the governor further Sorry, Amanda, go ahead further divided the state, the governor did, um, from those four regions to the 11. And he says it's he's able to do that because you have more testing and also more contact tracing, though plenty of critics will still say that Illinois is way too far behind on contact tracing, especially as people are allowed to go to bars, restaurants, sports camps, what have you. Regardless, I, I, it was a smart calculation, perhaps, um, on his part because of buy-in locally. There was a lot of frustration, griping. People were very angry to be grouped in. The Collar County saying, why are we in with the city of Chicago, which was really the hotbed of COVID-19. So this, I think, uh, from both a practical point of view, but from a political one, it is a smart decision on his part going forward. Yeah, I was just gonna say he took a pretty bad political hit downstate and, and in the middle of the state, although I think his numbers on handling of this are positive overall throughout the state, but there's dispatches in, in the small towns and rural areas in the state of Illinois of signs that say Pritzker sucks and there's been a lot of political opposition in counties that have not seen a lot. So this is an acknowledgement that there's a different reality, a political reality uh, in each part of the state. And, and if you can do this safely, then, you know, it seems like he's giving it a go. Meanwhile, you know, all eyes are on Chicago Public Schools this week, uh, where a lot of us education reporters are awaiting plans. Chicago Teachers Union Vice President Stacey Davis Gates was on the show just earlier this week and says that it is not safe to return to school. Let's hear what she had to say. Any school reopening plan is a plan that is only about mitigating risk, which means that there will still be harm. And that harm will come to the workers in the school community, it will come to the students in the school community, and it will come to their families. Heather, what do you think is going to happen here? Well, we should know more later this week. The mayor said today that she's going to release some sort of framework that will get the discussion started among the teachers union, parents, staff, all of the stakeholders, as she said, and that that plan is designed to be flexible as the public health data uh, changes. But she said, don't expect an up or down yes or no decision on in-person schooling until we get closer to Labor Day when school is scheduled to start again, simply because, uh, you know, they don't want to sort of make plans that they can't end up implementing because as we've seen, this pandemic can turn on a dime. But this is a huge source of consternation for parents. Um, and I think that uh, it's going to be another flashpoint between the mayor and the teachers union. 
Now, I want to move on a little bit because we've got a lot to talk about. The man who's second in command at the Chicago Police Department is stepping down. He spoke to Amanda this week, just yesterday, and says defunding the police won't work. Here's some of what he had to say. You cannot defund the police. The fact that you can get in your car and go to the grocery store or take your kids for a bike ride or take your dog for a walk is all dependent on the fact that there's police officers out there who can protect you. We both have to be willing to hit the reset button and say, we're gonna give this a try. We're gonna, we're gonna both give this a legitimate try that we're gonna welcome the community's input and we're gonna police them the way they wanna be policed and they have to welcome us into their neighborhoods. Amanda, does Riccio represent what the rank and file feel? Uh, rank and file, certainly not a monolith, but yes, I mean, the, the Chicago Police Department does not believe in defunding the Chicago Police Department. These officers, by and large, took on that as a job, as a calling, as a career for a multitude of reasons, uh, some of which may coincide with some of the people that are part of the movement to defund the police in terms of what they're wanting with um, community collaboration, mental health outreach, but certainly um, there, there's a continued loggerheads here regardless of who is number two at the CPD there has been some changeover but um yeah nobody there wants to defund the police I will briefly add that I think speaking with Riccio was enlightening given that of course the head of the CPD right now is somebody who's new I mean he just came in in mid-April and who should he come in at a very difficult point in time with COVID and of course summer rising crime and so speaking with somebody who's been at the department for 34, 35 years is in, in, it has all that perspective. I would say that while he's in the upper echelon, he's not rank and file anymore. He, he's speaking in concert with them, at least when it comes to that movement. And Amanda, you know, as you mentioned, there's been a bit of a shakeup. Superintendent David Brown today um, announcing uh, Anthony Riccio's replacement, also the new chief of patrol. You know, Paris, is any of this or these changes going to help with uh, the summer violence? Well, there's a lot of institutional knowledge that's leaving now, Brandis, and I don't know how much of this is senior brass saying, you know, we're throwing our hands up in the air, we can't take this new climate anymore, or David Brown saying, I want my team in here. Obviously, he needs um, some time uh, to establish his policing strategy, his team. There has been a spike in violence this summer. There's been a lot of people saying there are a lot of reasons for that, but let's look at what we know and hear from people on the ground. You know, we hear police officers say, there is a bit of maybe, you know, st standing back, standing down a little bit because of the climate. Perhaps um, criminals feel a little more emboldened to go out and act because of uh, the fact that cops are standing down a little bit. We know that there's a problem with the economy. There's a recession, a lot of people out of work. Pandemic, where lots of people are, are full of, uh, you know, kind of angst and anxiety. These are the things that we know are leading to higher violence. We don't know about uh, other things like are people out on electronic monitoring and are they perpetrating? In the past, the police department would, they've used this excuse, or I shouldn't say excuse if it's real. They've, they've said in the past, like here are people that were um, arrested that were out early or out on bail really early. They haven't said that this time. So we don't know the, the spike in violence in the last few months. We can't directly connect that with uh, people who are out on electronic monitoring as a lot of people want to claim. Now, President Trump took aim again at Chicago violence. Let's hear what he said yesterday in the White House Rose Garden. Look at what's happened to New York. Crime is up, shootings are up at numbers that nobody's ever seen before. Look at Chicago, what a disaster. And we're waiting for them to call us because we're all set to go. We have the FBI. We have Homeland Security. We have everybody ready to go. We have the National Guard. They're all ready to go. Carol, what does waiting for Chicago's call mean? It means that he's going to wait a really long time. <laughs> Chicago isn't calling. But let's also remember that while Chicago's seen a spike, so too is Philadelphia, Milwaukee, LA. You know, this is the intersection, and this is not to dismiss by any means Chicago's profound violence pandemic, but this is the intersection of violence and plague, where people, um, multi generational families, are locked in a house um, without an income, without a way to send their kids to school. It's a tinderbox for many, many cities, and Chicago is not the only one. And so to, uh, to pick it particularly out 
may have a reflection of whether they are democratically led or not. I think that is also another convergence of, of, uh, of information, but Chicago is not going to call the president as Mayor Lightfoot has made abundantly clear. Let's also add the fact that the federal government does assist in violence. I mean, the U.S. Attorney's Office has folks that are assisting in violence and, and gang mitigation, and you've got ATF and you've got DEA. None of that's new. Uh, and John Lausch, the U.S. Attorney here, has made a big sort of um, thing about stepping up the federal government's efforts. So it's not as if the federal government isn't already involved in this with the police department, and the president has made this claim many years, and it's pretty unclear what he means by, you know, call us up and we're going to send you more resources. I mean, the federal government is already trying to combat this. So today, the Illinois Democratic Party voted to support Senator Tammy Duckworth as a vice presidential running mate. Senator Dick Durbin talked about the junior senator at length, including how she fought back against the attack on her by Fox News host Tucker Carlson. Here's what Senator Durbin said. The nerve of that man to question the patriotism and judgment of this fine American and great Illinois senator. I am honored that she's being considered to be the running mate of Joe Biden. I have publicly stated that I'm supporting her in every way that I can. I hope that you will. The Democratic Party of Illinois is hereby on record supporting the candidacy of Tammy Duckworth for the office of Vice President of the United States. Carol, you spoke with her just a bit ago. Uh, you know, talk about her chances of being Veep. You know, I, I don't even know how to do the odds on this, Brandis, frankly. She certainly is on the short list, and Tucker Carlson would not have engaged in this kind of attack if the uh, Fox News and the right wing didn't think so. But the fact of the matter is that this is the most ca complicated calculus that you can do politically of, of who will attract the most votes from the most constituencies. I don't know what the answer is because they're also trying to figure out if Duckworth might be the vice president, who would be the secretary of state? Could that be Susan Rice? Could the attorney general be Kamala Harris? I don't know. But, but Tammy Duckworth is, um, is of serious interest. I don't know if she has uh, the sustainability to end up being the VP, however. Um, and Paris, we've got about 30 seconds left. You know, you had both the state and city elections boards on the show, but then there was that big Twitter cybersecurity breach. Um, what do you know? I'm not an expert on this, uh, Brandis, so I contacted an expert, Darren Guccione of Keeper Security, who told me it's a textbook, uh, in his mind, account takeover attack where cyber hackers, cyber criminals, they somehow got the data of uh, passwords and emails of all these high-profile people, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, and either this stuff is available on the dark web to purchase because it's, you know their emails have been hacked before. They took over the account. They said in their tweets that they put out fraudulently, Click here, donate to Bitcoin, and we'll uh, double that donation. So people fell for it. They donated about $100,000. Twitter shut down all verified accounts, saying we got to get to the bottom of this, and they're investigating how exactly these hackers did what they did. But it seems like they are professional hackers that uh, know what they're doing. Yeah, it looks like it. Okay, so we're going to have to leave it there. My thanks to Amanda Venicky, Carol Marine, Heather Sharon, and Paris Schutz. And up next, how a meatpacking plant came to host a vegan farmer's market on the southwest side. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight podcast and subscribe. A popular vegan pop-up market that had grown quite the following for its monthly events in Logan Square needed a new outdoor home and it found one in an unlikely place. Joining us now with more details about the new vegan farmer's market at a former meatpacking plant is WTTW News reporter Patty Wetley. So Patty, how did a vegan pop-up market make its way to a former meatpacking facility? Well, it's the Chicago Vegan Test Kitchen, uh, which had, as you mentioned, gotten quite popular at Emporium in Logan Square. Now it's going to be starting up on Sundays, starting August 2nd at the plant in back of the yards. And the plant actually um, is an incubator for small food businesses. There's about 20 businesses that operate out of what used to be Pure Foods, uh, which did a lot of processing of a lot of pork products. 
to the point that in the plant, they have taken what used to be old smokers, and those are actually the bathroom stalls, um, which is the most interesting repurposing of a building I think I've ever seen in my life. That is fascinating. So the market will run between August 2nd and September 6th. What yes. can visitors expect? Well, obviously it's a vegan market. So all of the food purveyors are going to be vegan, um, but there's a lot of actually bakers there. So you can get a lot of vegan baked goods. There will be tacos, tamales. There's also a lot of um, crafters who work in sort of like the eco conscious uh, vein. So you might see some people who are making things out of um, recycled materials. There will also be some farm stands there. And they also um, have a lot of vendors who make cruelty free um, hair care or skincare products. So quite an array will be available. But obviously don't expect any meat. Patty, well, right. no, you, meat. <laughs> no meat. Thank you so much for joining us, Patty. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read Patty's full story on our website where you'll find more on how you can sample some of the food and drinks being made at the plant. That's at WTTW.com slash news. And that's our show for this Wednesday night. Live at 7, our Chicago Tonight in Your Neighborhood series visits the city's Hermosa community. And meet a Chicago puppeteer who's making house calls with his doorstep marionette. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe. Good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm whose pro bono work kept open a church shelter for the homeless in Chicago's southern suburbs.